fact, the sermon that I'm going to share with you this morning, you're the you're going to get the uh, beta content. I'm going to work on you just so I get it ready for, for next week because they won't give me extra time like you will, right, Danny? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, I have to get this down well and and uh, share this. But we're going to be talking about preparation for missions uh, because we all need to be prepared uh, because we're all missionaries. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, thank you again for this time, Lord, that we can uh, be together in your word to hear from you. And Lord, we do ask, Lord, that by your spirit that we would have ears to hear what you have to say to us. Lord, not only to hear it, but to do it, because we know that's what you mean when you say, he that has an ear, let him hear so, Lord, that we would hear and obey your word. I pray, Lord, that, again, your word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, that your word it goes right down to the very heart of us. Lord, you know us. You judge us by the word. I pray that as we look into the mirror of your word, Lord, we would see the changes that we need to make in our lives by your grace and by your spirit. And, Lord, that we would just desire with all our heart to do what you call us to do. Lord, thank you. We love you. We praise you. Lord, we do remember our, our brothers and sisters in Zambia and Lord, indeed, around the world uh, that we have the privilege to be a part of their lives and the ministry, Lord, that you are doing there in saving souls and in proclaiming the name of Jesus that is powerful to save whosoever will believe on the Lord. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would just continue to Work in them, empower them, strengthen them by your spirit and word. And Lord, help us uh, to be diligent in doing our part in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, we're going to talk about preparing for missions, being prepared for missions. I don't think I need to... to uh, say this, but I'm, you know, just for point, to make the point, we are all missionaries. If you have called upon the name of the Lord, if you are saved, if you are one who has been redeemed by the blood of Christ, He's given you His Holy Spirit, you are a child of God, you are a missionary. The Lord has called you to be an ambassador for Christ. And so we need to be prepared. We need to think outside of our comfort zone. We need to realize that God has called us to be more than just Christians in name only. Mm, amen? amen? More than just a Christian in name only. And, and many of us, I've been there. You've been there. A lot of times we're Christians in name only. Lord, forgive us. Because the word Christian given to the believers in Antioch was a description of men and women who were truly disciples of Jesus Christ. They were making a difference. They were impacting the, the, the uh, area of Antioch where they were at. And they were being made fun of by being called Christians because these people were, they were truly representing Jesus Christ. They were a little Christ. It was a term of derision. How many of us can say that, you know, people call us Christian because they're making fun of us? Not too often, is it? But that's where we're supposed to be. And that means we have to have a change of heart and a change of mind. We need to remember some things. I want to read to you here out of Acts chapter 1. These first 11 verses, I want to make just a couple points. How do we prepare for missions? We're going to look at, we prepare for missions by uh, having the right message. The right message is the kingdom of God. We prepare for missions by having the right source of power, which is the Holy Spirit. We prepare for missions by knowing what our mission is. Verse 8, which we're going to camp out on most time. And then the last point that I'm going to make in that last, uh, last part there is, is that, are we going? Are we, are, we're prepared. Now, what are we doing? What are we doing? 
And so those are the things we're going to look at as we go through verses 1 to 11. Let me read them from the Holman Christian Standard. Uh, you can follow along. Here we go. Verse 1. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After he had, after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Let me stop there. I'm going to just, instead of reading the whole thing, I'll just, let's look at each, each portion here. What is the message? If you're going to be prepared for missions, you got to know what your message is. Jesus, when he rose from the dead and then he appeared to the disciples for those next 40 days before his ascension, he was teaching them and reminding them of what he had already taught them, but he was, he was speaking to them about the kingdom of God. You know, when John the baptizer came, he came preaching the kingdom of God. Prepare. The kingdom of God is here. It's near. Get ready. Prepare your heart. When Jesus came on the scene, he preached the same thing. The kingdom of God is near. And obviously he was talking about himself being the king of the kingdom. That, hey, the kingdom of God is near. Prepare your hearts. How did they prepare their hearts? By repenting and believing. Repent. The kingdom of God is near. And so Jesus is now again, during these 40 days, he's talking to the disciples about the kingdom of God. And church, I would present to you today that you and I need to be thinking about the kingdom of God and how to present that to people because Jesus is coming. Amen. He is coming and when he comes, he will inaugurate and he will bring the kingdom of God to earth just as he taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And it is coming. When Jesus comes, the kingdom comes. We're not ushering it in. We're not helping Jesus to bring it here. When he comes, he's going to bring it because we can't get it here. And, and it really is an answer to that prayer that says, Thy kingdom come. Lord, bring your kingdom. Because we can't bring it in. There's certain theologies that think that somehow if we love the earth enough and love one another enough and just do good enough and take over the governments and everything that somehow we'll usher in the kingdom of God. Won't happen. Won't happen. I, we've read the end of the story, haven't we? Things get worse before Jesus comes back. The world is falling apart because it needs Jesus. So he's teaching, Jesus is teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God. He's also reminding us that that's our message. In fact, the last couple verses of Acts, we see Paul in prison under house arrest. And what's he doing? He's teaching the kingdom of God. He's telling people to get ready for Jesus' is coming. And the reason that we need to be preaching the same thing is because people that are not ready for Jesus will not enjoy the kingdom of God. They will not be able to benefit from the Lord's kingdom coming. You need to be prepared for the kingdom of God. And how do you prepare for the kingdom of God? You must be born again. John chapter 3. Jesus told Nicodemus, you know, flesh and blood, uh, uh, you've got to be born again. You've got, it's, it's by the water and by the spirit that you inherit the kingdom of God, that you, you'll come in. You have, to, you have to call upon the name of the Lord. You have to have your heart changed. Now, this is what I want you to hear. This is the gospel part of this. For those of you that may not know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you may not be ready for the kingdom. Because when Jesus comes, that's it. And when you die, that's it. Because when you die, Jesus has come. You know, that's why, that's why the, the time is near for all of us. We don't know our day. We don't know the hour when we will breathe our last and we'll stand before the Lord and give an account. Whether saved or unsaved, we're going to give an account. Are you ready to meet Jesus? And to be ready, you must first you must repent. Paul said he came preaching repentance toward the Father and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you repented toward God? Have you admitted that you are lost and that you are that you are have sinned against the God who loves you, whose holiness demands perfection and holiness? Have you confessed your sin before Him? And said, Lord, I am a sinner. I do deserve hell fire. I deserve the lake of fire. Because of your holy wrath. 
But Lord, I repent. I acknowledge who I am. I acknowledge who you are. You are the holy God of the universe. You are the creator of all things. I owe allegiance to you. Have you done that? Have you come to that place of repentance? Because until you repent, you can believe all day long and not be saved. You must repent. Turn to the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge who He is and who you are. You're lost. You don't deserve heaven. You don't deserve His grace and mercy. You don't deserve His loving kindness. But you know His loving kindness has been extended to you, to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. God who became man. Who died on the cross for your sin. Who rose from the dead for your justification that you might be made righteous. He came and died for you. Do you believe then on the Lord Jesus Christ? You can't be good enough. You cannot do enough good long enough to be saved. Only Jesus could do that for you. He's the one who came and lived for you. He lived righteously, perfectly for you. And he died for you, taking your sin, my sin, upon himself, upon the cross. So that God could be satisfied in His holiness. His wrath could be satisfied where He doesn't have to rain His wrath upon you and me who justly deserve it. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ today? Have you believed? Repent. The kingdom of God is near. Jesus is coming back. And you're going to die someday. If you don't see Jesus come back before you die, you're still going to die. Aren't we all getting older? Young people think they're going to live forever. I used to think that. I know Danny did. We all did. We all did. We all thought we were going to live forever. It's not, we, we're all dying. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, sin. Our own sin. The wages of sin is death. Are you prepared to meet the Lord today? Repent. The kingdom of God is near. And you will not see the kingdom of God. You will not see Christ in His glory here on earth if you do not repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message we're to preach. Are you prepared? Do you know the message? Number two goes along with that, which I've always touched on, is that you must be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Listen to this, verse 4 through 7. While He was together with them, that is, while Jesus was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. For John baptized with water. Okay, catch that. John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Church, unless you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you cannot be called the church, number one. You cannot be saved. You know, just, you know, how many of us have been baptized in water? Raise your hand. All right. That means you profess faith in Christ and you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And did the water baptize you? No. Pastor baptized you or some other minister of the gospel baptized you, took you into that pool of water and dumped you down there and brought you back up, and they baptized you in water. Just as John the Baptist, baptizer, I like to say, there wasn't a Baptist back then, but John the Baptizer, he baptized those who repented, baptized them in water. Jesus is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit if you will believe on Him. Repent and believe, and Jesus will baptize you with His Holy Spirit. This is the gift of life. The Spirit of life who comes in you, and you receive the Spirit of God when you're saved. When you can't be born again without the Spirit of life. It's the Holy Spirit who regenerates you, who makes you alive in Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who identifies us with one another as the body of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who identifies us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 6. That's why you and I, we have no excuse for sin today. Because we have the Spirit of God in us who has identified us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We have died with Christ. We have been crucified with Him. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I should live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave Himself for me. 
That's what, the, that's what spiritual baptism is. You have been prepared if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have been prepared for missions because you have the Holy Spirit in you. The disciples, and we don't have time for this, and this is something Danny, I'm sure, is, is, Pastor Dan has taught this many times before, but they were waiting for the first inauguration, the first coming of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit came and, and initiated and, and started His church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first time at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. But since that time, everyone who believes is baptized with the Holy Spirit at the moment of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? <coughs> Remember that. Somebody asked you, have you been baptized with the Spirit? You should say, I'm saved. Yes, if you've been saved. If you know you're going to heaven today, you also should know that you have received the Holy Spirit. He is in you, empowered you. Listen to what they say in verse 6. It says, For, and So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, at this time are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, there's a, now some people think that the disciples were just totally messed up on their understanding of the kingdom. I don't agree with that at all. I think they understood quite well what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God. They're asking him for a time. They're saying, is it time? Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel to Israel? Are you coming again? Are you going to sit on the throne of Israel? Are you going to be the king of the, of the earth? The king of kings, Lord of lords? Are you going to magnify and manifest yourself now? Is it time? They were asking for time. Is it time for the kingdom to come? And Jesus told them what we've read in the Gospels before. It's not for you to know. It's not for you to know the time or the season. That's in the Father's hand. You know, he even said in, in Matthew, I believe it is, that he himself doesn't even know. That's the Father's business. Not, that's not our business. If Jesus doesn't know, we can't know. Amen? So all these date setters, time setters, and people that say Jesus is going to come back on this date or that date, don't get caught up in that. That's immaturity. That is immaturity. Jesus will come when the Father tells him to come. And it will be the right time. And we should be ready all the time. Amen? All the time. <coughs> You know, that's, that's all that matters. Be ready, Christian. If you're unsaved, get ready. Believe. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's time. It's not for you to know the time or the periods that the Father has set by His own authority. But you, verse 8, here's the third point. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. How do you prepare for missions? You've got to know the message. You have to have the power. But you also have to understand what you're supposed to do. What you were supposed to do. Jesus said, but you. He wasn't just looking at Peter when he said that. He was looking at all the disciples that were in his presence at that time. You as plural. And through the pages of scriptures, he's looking at every single one of us. But you. But you, it says, verse 8, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You, in other words, going back to the, the point I just made, when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you received the Holy Spirit who identifies you with the body of Christ, with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, who is, is why you're born again, you received power. You received power when the Holy Spirit came upon you. Do you believe that today? Do you have ears to hear that today? I have to ask myself that all the time. Because I have received power from the Holy Spirit the moment I believed when I was 16 years old. Up at Pekin Bible Church. That day I bowed my knee before the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, I need you. And God saved me, Christ saved me, gave me His Holy Spirit. I received power at that moment. And so did you. You have received power from the Holy Spirit. Do you really believe it? Now ask yourself, do you really believe that? 
I asked myself that, and I said, yes, I believe it. And then my inner voice says, and why aren't you doing something with that power? Why aren't you, why aren't you living in that power? Because... The Lord Jesus went on to say, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be. Not you might be, but you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. You know that every one of you, every one of us, who claims the name of Jesus, who calls ourselves Christian, every one of us is a witness whether good or bad. Amen? Amen? When people see you, when people see me, they see Jesus. Oh my goodness. We represent Christ. You want your world to change? You want your family and friends to change? Remember that you are Jesus before them. That's why we should saturate ourselves with the Gospels and see how Jesus responded and reacted to people around him in his day. Because Jesus, we represent him. He said that greater works than I, that you will do than I did. You will do greater works than me. Because I go to be with the Father and I give you the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't remember the last time that I walked on water. Let's see, let me think. I slipped and fell in the bathtub before, you know. I don't remember the last time that I went up to someone I loved who had died and raised them up from the dead. I don't remember the last time that because of me I laid my hands on somebody and they were instantly healed. I don't remember ever saying, you know, stand up, take up your bed and walk. And that happening. What did Jesus mean by greater works than these will you do? Jesus was limited by his choice to abide. The God of the universe, the one who is omnipresent, he limited himself to a body on earth and he ministered in the immediate geographical area where he stood and his voice was heard and he could touch and, and feel people. Today he has been multiplied many millions of times over in the hearts and lives of you and me who have the Spirit of God in us. That's how we do greater works. We represent Jesus Christ all around the world. We bring the saving gospel of Jesus Christ through our lips and our lives. That is the great miracle. Do we pray for miracles when we need them? Amen. Better pray. Pray, pray, pray. Lord, heal this person. Lord, help me to walk on waters of difficulty, you know, whatever, you know. Pray, God, and you know, the Lord gives us great grace and He's merciful to us. He helps us. He gives us miracles. Thank the Lord. But not in the sense of Jesus who raised the dead. Not in the sense of the apostles who represented Christ in that inauguration of the church. Does Jesus raise the dead today? I'm sure he does. I'm sure he can. But he won't do it through my hands or will do it through yours or anybody else's. He'll do it because we pray. Because we trust him. Because we believe him. And he'll do it if he wants to. If it be thy will, Lord. Amen? Amen? That's what we have to remember. Because I tell you what, if you don't know it already, I know you do, uh, but, but life, Christian life, is not a bed of roses. The Christian life is not easy. The Christian life is filled with struggle and turmoil and, and suffering and pain and sorrow. Man of sorrow, what a name. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. He had no place to lay his head. He had a stone for a pillow. Who do we think we are to think that, you know, because I got saved, everything ought to be wonderful. My bank account ought to be flush. I ought to be having everything I want. All my felt needs met. That is not the Christian life. The Christian life is that we represent the Lord Jesus Christ in a dead, dying, falling, fallen world. 
and they don't like us. If you've got a lot of friends and you're a Christian, maybe there's a problem. Amen? If everybody likes you in the world and, you're, and you call yourself a Christian, there might be a problem. I'm not saying we go out and be stinkers and make everybody mad at us just because I want to make sure they know I'm a Christian. But if you name the name of Jesus, people will be offended by that name. His name is a stumbling block. It divides family from family, friends from friends. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You have received power. You are his witnesses. The word witness mean is the word martyr in the Greek. And when I looked at that word and I thought about witness and I'm thinking about, you know, just exactly what does it mean to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, it tells me that I am to be a martyr for Christ. Not a jihadist martyr, not these wackos and, and Islamists that go out and kill themselves and other people in the name of Allah. I am to have died with Christ. I have been buried with Christ. I have been risen with Christ. I have died with that spiritual baptism I received. I died with Christ. I have been martyred. You are a martyr. You are dead. It's no longer you who should be alive. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, let me just put it in a nutshell. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, that means you died. We die to ourselves. We die to our wants. We die to everything that we think that we are and who we are. We die to all of that. We're dead to that. Jesus said, unless you die, you cannot be my disciple. How many of us have accepted the death that we have in Christ? Now, I'm not talking, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. Don't get confused here about the terminology we were dead in our trespasses and said, I was dead spiritually. When Jesus saved me, he made me alive in Christ. But also what he did when he, when he saved me, he gave me the Spirit of God and identified me with his death. I have died with Christ. I have been buried with him in baptism, spiritual baptism. We are dead. Colossians chapter 3. You are dead. You are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Have you died in your heart and mind? Have you accepted that martyrdom? Are you a witness? God said you are a witness, good or bad. You're either a good witness or a bad witness. But have you accepted the fact that you are a witness? You are a martyr for Christ. Ask yourself that question. Ask yourself that question. You're not only a witness, but where are you a witness? You're a witness in Jerusalem, right here in Delavan, Illinois. Somebody asked me where I'm from. I said, I'm from this corn country, Illinois, Delavan, Illinois. But you know what? People in Delavan need the Lord. You know where Lou Ann and I live now in Clarksville, Tennessee? I forget the exact population, 120, 130,000 people. 85% of them do not go to church. <clears throat> this is in the South. And of the 15% that go to church, you and I know that many of them aren't saved because that's all churches. And even in our good evangelical churches, there's people that are unsaved. <clears throat> How about Delavan? Think about it. You know, we should not get our noses all out of shape and, and everything because we think, oh, you know, so many people just don't go to church. Well, why should they if they're not saved? They don't come to church to get saved, amen? You come to church because you are saved. You gather together to build up one another and to strengthen one another and to encourage one another to come and, and be taught of the Word, from the Word. To worship God together, to rejoice together, to share your sorrows together, to pray for one another, to love one another. That's why you come to church. You don't come to church to get saved, though it's not a bad place to be. If unsaved people come here, it's okay. They don't come here to get saved, but they, 
may come here to see if God is truly in your presence. <clears throat> you and I, we are the witnesses. We are to go out into the world and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dead, dying, lost world. Everywhere you go, everybody you see, all the time, they are someone who you are to represent Jesus Christ to. With your lips and your lives. Every one of us. And we're all guilty. We're all guilty of forgetting when we see that person outside of the church, outside of, of our, our little uh, faith circle. We forget that very possibly and probably that person is lost and they are dead already, Jesus said. They're already on their way to a, an eternal hell because of their sin. And God loves them. Christ died for them. And you and I are the only means by which they will hear with their ear that gospel that will save them. The gospel is powerful to save. But it has to come from our lives and our lips. We are witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Judea, we understand, is maybe our state or the U.S., Samaria would be the people that we don't like. Now I'm telling you right now, I've got a son, Joseph, you all, a lot of you know Joe, my oldest, our oldest, is in the army, been in there for 18 years or so, and been in Afghanistan and Iraq three or four times in harm's way. I've got a son-in-law, Mary Beth's husband, same thing. I don't like Muslims. I don't like Islam. I don't like that. And yet, the Word of God tells me that God loves them. Those murderous, hateful people, God loves them. Christ died for them. Am I willing to be a witness, a martyr in our Samaria? Maybe you have family members that just detest you because you've become a Christian and they no longer associate with you and like you. They're your Samaria. Do you love them? Do you want them to be saved? Are you willing to take the animosity and the ridicule and not, and not personalize it and say, oh, whoa, it's me. I can't believe they feel this way about me. They should, you know, I'm such a nice person. Don't we think that way? No. They're your Samaria. Love them. Love those who hate you. Pour your life out before them. Be a martyr for Christ and for their sake. And to the uttermost parts of the earth, it says here in, in verse 8, it says, to the ends of the earth. You and I are not only responsible for our Delavan, for our United States, for the Samaria, but we are responsible to the ends of the earth. And no generation of Christians has the potential and possibility of reaching the ends of the earth like we do today. I told Sunday school class this morning, I'm a nobody from nowhere, not thinking that Delavan's just a nowhere, but I mean, you know, think about it. Think about it. Who are we? We're just country folk from central Illinois, corn country. And yet we have the potential to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Like never before. It has been my privilege and our privilege in, with Hope Builders Ministry to represent you, to represent them, but to minister to thousands of men with the gospel, teaching them the word of God so that they can represent the gospel in their country to win multiple thousands of people to Christ, to build up the church of God in Zambia. And that's just one little spot that we can have a huge impact in. We do have a huge impact in. I have a, I have a young man named Stephen Prasad that I've been... I've been discipling via the internet since, what, 2008? 
something like that. Stephen just got married, married Glory, here just this last couple weeks ago. 38 years old, minister of the gospel. And I've had the privilege of ministering to him and helping him via the internet, email, Skype, telephone, talking to him how he can be a better and more effective witness in his area, teaching him the hub model, teaching him how to make disciples instead of, instead of him trying to, to be the leader of 500 men and pastors that he realized that, you know, get you a few men and train them, pour your life into them, and allow them to then pour their lives into others and so on, you'll reach many, many multiple hundreds and even thousands that way versus just working with a few hundred men. And then you won't be, when you're working with so many people, you, you're shallow. You can't go deep. But if you work with three men, you go deep. Each one of you, let me just challenge you as I close here, as I'm going to look at this last paragraph for just a minute. Let me challenge you. Are you a believer today? If you're a believer, you're supposed to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus told us, go make disciples. Amen? You are my witnesses. Go make disciples. To be a disciple, you must be a maker of disciples. Don't call yourself a disciple of Christ, a, even a Christian, if you're not making disciples. The word Christian applies to disciples, not to believers. A lot of us are believers and not disciples of Christ. I want to challenge you with that. If you are a disciple of Christ, are you pouring your life into someone else? And I don't care how old you are. Whether you're a young Christian, a young believer, you're 12, 13 years old today. Or whether you're 15 or 18, or whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, it doesn't matter. Are you making disciples? Are you pouring your life into a few good men and good women so that they can multiply themselves into a few good men and good women to be disciples of Jesus Christ. You will, this church will explode if you will do that. Do you believe that today? I'm telling you, it'll work. I've watched it happen in Zambia. I've watched the mouths of these pastors in Zambia drop open when you tell them that you can do this and your church will grow, your community will be one to Christ, and you'll plant other churches and other communities by you if you will do this, if you will make disciples by just pouring yourself into a few other men. And then when they do that in a year or two years, three years, they see this thing begin to explode and they realize it's true. That's why... We're told to make disciples. Teach other men who will teach others also. Paul told Timothy. Paul, Timothy, his other faithful men who will teach others also. You do the same thing. If I do that, you do that, the church will have an impact like we've never seen before. You don't have to think in numbers of, I can't win, I can't win 50 people to Christ this year. You're not supposed to. Make disciples. Jesus said, I will build my church. Amen? And he told us to make disciples. Christ will take care of his church. We make disciples. Just think by families, not individuals. Just think by families today. If by families, each of you would make it a point in your heart, Lord, I want to be a disciple maker as you've commanded me. It's not an option. It's a command. And so, Lord, I want to be a disciple maker. As families, you decide, Lord, help me to make a disciple. And you reach out. You begin to pray and reach out and pour yourself into someone's life. Lead them to Christ. Raise them up in the Lord. Bring them to church so they can be taught and joined together in the body of Christ. Because you can't be a disciple if you're not a member of the local church, too. Make it a point. Don't, don't get passive. Don't be passive. Don't continue to be passive. Get active and say, I want to be a disciple maker. Repent. The kingdom of God is near, church. When Jesus comes back and he looks at us and we stand before him, is he going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant? He's going to say, well done, if you've been a disciple maker. Don't dumb this thing down.
Don't think that, okay, if I'm just good enough, if I don't, if I don't step over the edge and just do something stupid, I'll be okay. And Jesus will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Don't bury the pearl. Don't bury that treasure. Invest it. Make disciples. Amen? Amen. Make disciples. And that's what Jesus, I'm going to close with this. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud received them out of their sight. There, verse 10. While he was going, they were gazing up into heaven and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by him. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, some translations say, this same Jesus who, you have been who has been taken up from you into heaven, he will come in the same way that, he, that you have seen him going into heaven. Now, translate. Translate. What are you standing around for? What are you standing around for? This je same Jesus that you see going, he's coming again. Get busy. Be a witness. Make disciples. He's coming again. He's coming again. Are you ready? Am I ready? Jesus is coming again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for challenging us, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that your word would burn. Would burn in our hearts. Lord, even let it be bitter in our mouths if we have not been doing what you called us to do so that it might become sweet in our stomach as we obey you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much that you died for us. You gave us eternal life. But Lord, you've loved us so much that Lord, you've called us to represent you, to be a part of your mission to seek and to save the lost. Lord, I pray that we would be found faithful, making disciples as you've commanded us to be. Lord, that we would truly be a witness. Lord, that we would die to ourselves. That, Lord, that the Romans 12, 1 would be, would be a part of our lives, that we have become living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you, Lord. Lord, I love you today. Thank you for loving me. Lord, we love you as the Prairie Bible Church. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name.